Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kate, and I am an educator at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. And today we are coming to you with a program about Pearl Harbor. But you're not just going to be hearing from educators from the National World War II Museum this time. You're also going to be joined by two educators from the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. And the mission of the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum is to steward America's first aviation battlefield of World War II, sharing the artifacts, personal stories, impact and response to the attack on December 7th, 1941, and the Pacific region battles that followed. And of course, to honor those who have defended our freedom so we might educate and inspire future generations. So we're gonna be watching a clip from our Pearl Harbor electronic field trip, and then we're gonna turn it over to the museum to talk a little bit about their museum. And the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum is housed in actual World War II era hangars at the center of where the attack on Pearl Harbor occurred. So visitors, and today we're gonna do it virtually, can stand where the first bombs fell on that fateful day in 1941. So I'm gonna go ahead and play that clip and then we'll come on to talk a little bit more about their museum. I'm here at Pearl Harbor with Mr. Jimmy Lee, who is an 11-year-old boy when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. He's going to help me explore the sites around Oahu. To answer our next question, how did the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor? Well, let me tell you, when I was living here, all I know is that the planes came over, over the treetop. You know, being an 11-year-old kid, hey, that was something, that was really something. And today, when you look at this place here, I mean, it, it's nice and calm. But you know, 75 years ago, let me tell you, this was heck. I mean, with the planes coming in, the bombing, the fire, the smoke, the, the gunfire, that was really something. So it sounds like what you witnessed really stuck with you. What was Hawaii like before the attack? Well, you know, before the attack, there was a lot of planes, you know, like an everyday thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we had maneuvers and we had ships going in and out there. We fit nothing like that. And then when it happened, oh, I tell you, I was so curious. I just ran out there and, you know, took a look and saw what the attack was like. But there's more I want to show you after a while when we get over to the, the other areas. See that island in the middle of the harbor? That's Fort Island. The United States Navy found that island to be the perfect place to tie up its big battleship. I think that's a good place to start our exploration. Julia, we're now at the Pacific Aviation Museum, Pearl Harbor. And we'll be joined by the museum educator, Ford Ebesukawa. Hi. My friend Eliana, back at the National World War II Museum, learned all about why the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. So I'm supposed to find out how. Well, you've come to the right place. But we have to start before December 7th. The planning in Japan for the attack occurred months in advance. So why don't we learn more about the Japanese strategy? On November 26, 1941, six aircraft carriers left Japan, taking a route across the Northern Pacific, headed for Hawaii and the United States Pacific Fleet anchored there. By December 7th, the Japanese attack force was about 230 miles northwest of Hawaii. It was a Sunday morning when their attack began. Soon after sunrise, the first wave of Japanese planes took off from the decks of their aircraft carriers to begin their attack on Pearl Harbor. Many U.S. servicemen and residents on Oahu were just starting their day when the attack began without warning. You guys voted on what you wanted to see to tell the story further. Let's check out what you selected. Looks like the students chose the Japanese wreckage zero. Could you tell us what kind of plane this is? Well, was? Well, this is a Mitsubishi Zero. Again, it was a fighter aircraft. This Zero uh, was piloted by Airman First Class Shige Nori Nishikaichi. And Nishikaichi's responsibility that Sunday morning was to provide fighter cover 
and strafing attacks, apparently Nishikaichi's aircraft was struck by ground fire and he began losing fuel. In fact, he began losing fuel at such a rate, he realized that he could not fly back to his carrier, which was over 250 miles north of the island. So Nishikaichi elected to crash land on the tiny Hawaiian island called Niha. Did the pilot survive? Nishikaichi did survive, and the native Hawaiian islanders that, that resided on the island, they had no idea what had just happened at Pearl Harbor. So they assumed that Nishikaichi was just a wayward pilot that just happened to crash land on their island. So when they helped him out of that aircraft, they literally treated him as a guest. In fact, they held a luau for him that, that evening. Wow. Wow. So what did he do with the plane afterwards that it looks like this? Well, because the Japanese Zero was uh, a top secret aircraft, he did not want the aircraft to fall in enemy hands, the Americans. So Nishikaichi attempted to burn the aircraft. After a few days later, some of the Hawaiian Islanders were able to pick up on the radio what exactly happened at Pearl Harbor. Okay. So they kind of put two and two together and kind of figured Nishikaichi must be an enemy pilot. Mm -hmm. So they put him under guard, but Nishikaichi was, was able to obtain a handgun and he literally tried to take over the island. Wow. And one of the Hawaiian Islanders that he attempted to take hostage, defended himself, and ultimately killed Nishikaichi. <laughs> and military historians believe that this was one of the first land engagements between the United States and Japan on American soil. So, Jimmy, do you remember seeing any of these kind of planes flying overhead? Oh, yes, sure did. But, you know, let's go outside where we can explain and see it a little better. So Hangar 79 was damaged during the attack and is now a part of the Pacific Aviation Museum. Could You're you tell us a little yeah. about it? You're correct. Uh, in fact, if you look on the hangar windows there, it still bears the scars of that uh, December 7th morning, the bullet holes in the windows. Mm -hmm. Hangar 79 at the time of the attack was a maintenance and engine repair facility. So you can pretty much imagine this hangar was probably filled with aircraft that were based out of Pearl Harbor at the time. But rather than hear me talk, why don't we go inside and uh, let's meet somebody that was actually here on the attack. Okay. I'm so honored to be with all of you today. Thank you. Yeah, let me introduce these uh, distinguished gentlemen. Uh, my immediate left is Eddie Young, Ian Burney, and Dick Jiraco. So how did you guys feel when you saw all the planes flying overhead or the ships on fire? Like, how did that stick with you? I was six and a half and had just started first grade. And I was out playing in the yard that Sunday morning and I saw some airplanes and we had never seen an airplane where we lived. My father was concerned when he heard the shells nearby. So he pushed me back in the house and we listened to our old Philco tabletop radio. And there was a local radio personality named Webley Edwards who kept repeating, this is the real McCoy, we are under attack. This is the real McCoy. It was a beautiful Sunday morning and I, got out of my house and grabbed my old hand-me-down bicycle and I looked out in the sky and all of a sudden I saw this Japanese Zero flying overhead and my neighbor was next to me. I nudged him and he was about 23 years old. I was nine and I told him, Mr. Milamai, that's a Japanese Zero because we draw planes at, at school and I know that's a Zero. And he said, no, that's one of ours, Eddie. And finally he looked up and he saw the rising sun under the wings. And later, as I looked toward Pearl Harbor, when the uh, zero passed over, he went to Pearl and I saw all the flak in the air. So I knew this was the real thing. In a few minutes, I saw a big plume of smoke go up, went up 200 feet. It was not black, it was red. There was the Arizona and eventually it turned black. How about you? How did you feel? Well, to begin with, I was in the Navy and I was in a squadron of PBY Catalina flying boats. 
We were based here on uh, Ford Island in Hangar 54, which is the next one over from this one. What got our attention first was the noise that dive bombers were making coming down on our seaplane ramp. And we thought it was the Army Air Corps playing tricks on us. They used to come by on occasion and dive bomb us and drop flower sacks on us. So we all run out to front of the hangar and looked up. Didn't realize instantly that they were Japanese. Of course, when they released their bombs, they didn't look like flower sacks. And of course, when they pulled out their dives, they could see the red circle on the wings. And then it was a matter of self-preservation, get under cover somewhere. And there was no cover at all. So as luck would have it, they were putting a pipeline of some sort in out here between the, the hangars and the runway. And they hadn't put the pipe in it yet. So we all got in that. And basically, we were practically underground. So basically what I remember the most was the noise and the concussions. After about an hour, everything stopped. Second wave come over after about 15, 20 minutes. So when that happened, back in the ditch for another hour. So was there any moment during that morning when you really realized that your life was going to be different? When nightfall came, then everyone in the neighborhood was shaking and being afraid that we don't know whether they landed troops or not. And there were rumors about trier troopers going up to the reservoir and putting poison in the water. So everybody started filling their bathtubs with drinking water. We were out of school for a couple of weeks and I have, still have an ID issued by the territory on January 7th, 1942, which coincides with when I was fingerprinted and given an ID and issued a gas mask. And I carried that gas mask throughout the war. So thank you all so much for sharing your stories with me and thank you for your service to the country. You're very welcome. Julia, this is another beautiful spot on Troll Harbor. You never can learn of the attack in Oahu. Right here is the Battleship Missouri Memorial. And out there in the harbor is the USS Arizona Memorial. Under that memorial is the sunken remains of the Arizona and her men. 75 years ago, this area on Floyd Island was called Battleship Road, where U.S. battleships were lined up on the morning of December 7th. Battleship Row was one of the Japanese pilots' primary targets. Some dropped specially designed torpedoes that tore huge holes into ships below the waterline. Some dropped bombs onto the decks of the ships, producing giant explosions. The U.S. sailors headed to their battle stations in a brave effort to down Japanese planes, but did little damage to the enemy. By the time the attack was over, all eight U.S. battleships were either heavily damaged or sunk. Long may and more than 2,400 servicemen, mostly U.S. Navy sailors, had been killed. A further 1,200 people were wounded. The deadliest attack that day came when a 1,760-pound bomb was dropped onto the deck of the USS Arizona. It struck the ship's magazine where the Arizona's ammunition was stored. A massive explosion ripped through the forward part of the ship and created a huge fireball killing 1,177 of the crew on board. Half of the loss of life at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941 came on the Arizona. Wow, that is so sad. This place is so beautiful. I can't even imagine that all that destruction happening 75 years ago. Did the Japanese attack anywhere else that day? Oh yes, not only on, over Pearl Harbor, but over at Hickam. And as I look up towards the mountainside up there, planes were attacking there too. And in front of me, you know, they were attacking out there in a place called Eva. And of course, on the other side of the island, several other bases were hit too. 
The explosion from the USS Arizona was huge. Could you see it from where you were? Oh yes, I could see it real clearly and I tell you it was something that you'll never forget. But you know, when we get to the other side we can go somewhere else and I can show you a better view. You know, here in this fish pond, this is where I grew up. So what were you doing up here in the morning of the attack? You know, I grew up on a farm right here. And that morning, I was feeding the pigs. That's my job. Look, look at that coconut tree. See how high it is? Well, that plane just came over our pig pen. Just that high. When I looked up there, there were hundreds of planes, you know, flying. And it was so... So fascinating to me. I never saw so many planes in all my life. So were you scared when you realized that it wasn't a show and that it was Hawaii being under attack? No. Was I scared? The answer is no. It was exciting. It was so interesting. So did you and your family hide after they realized it was Japanese? Well, you know, we watched for about over an hour and a half. And that's when the loudspeakers come by and they said, hey, we're at war. We've been bombed by the Japanese. You know what we did? We took off up into the mountains up there, up in the valley, hid out in the caves. And then we came back home and the attack was over. Less than three hours was over. And one of the things that happened that afternoon, of course, was martial law came in effect. And you know, with martial law, we had curfews, we had rationing and everything else. But then from that day on, it was fear. Mm -hmm. It was fear. Although Jimmy was unharmed, 68 civilians were killed during the attack. Neighborhoods like this one were damaged by enemy fire. Take this house right across from Wheeler Army Airfield. An off-target Japanese bomb landed right in their yard. All right, everyone. So you heard there from the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum a little bit, but we are going to turn it over to them because many of us who are stuck inside in the mainland wishing we were in Hawaii can't wait to virtually talk about your museum. So Melissa and Ford, I will turn it over to you guys. All right. Thank you. All right. So hey guys, my name is Melissa. You probably recognize Ford from the video. It's our little celebrity we have here. All right, so now that we've heard about how Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, we just wanna share um, some more pictures with you guys so that you can learn a little bit more about the historical sites and where everything is located in the harbor so you can better visualize what was happening there that day. And we also just wanna share with you a little bit more about our museum and what Fort Island is like today. So we have some pictures here I'm gonna pull up. All right, so our museum is on Ford Island. So Ford Island, they pointed out in the video, is that island that's in the middle of the harbor. So in 1940, Ford Island became the exclusive property of the US Navy. So when the attack began in 1941, as you can see in this picture, they had a runway here for aircraft to land. There were lots of aircraft on the island. You can see some hangars over here. And up here at the top, this little square that's up here in this Thing that looks like a line is actually the control tower and hangar 37 that are part of our museum today. And also at this time, the US Navy had the majority of its Pacific fleet anchored off of Ford Island in the harbor. And if you look over here, we can see the battleships, and this is where Battleship Row was and where subsequently the Arizona will be sunk. Or did you want to add anything to this? No, that was great. Yeah. Okay. All right, so Ford's going to go ahead and talk to us about this picture from that day. This photo that you see here is the moment that the, the, the destroyer USS Shaw exploded. And the Shaw was in dry dock. And just similar to what happened to the Arizona, its ammunition stores were struck by a Japanese bomb. And that's that huge explosion that you see. And this photo was taken... Uh, from Ford Island, not far from our hangar, where the museum is. And so you can see the sailors and the, the chaos and the destruction, and everybody's turning to watch the explosion of the USS Shaw that was in dry dock at Pearl Harbor. 
So then we have this other picture here. This is the control tower in the administrative office building that is located with our museum. Um, this building had a few other purposes too. At one point it was barracks and a fire station. And we'll show you an updated picture of that in just a few minutes. So we just wanna give you a look at what uh, Fort Island looks like today. So right here is where our museum is that we've been talking about. There's that control tower and Hangar 37 and Hangar 79. Now, if you were to visit Pearl Harbor, there are four historical sites that you can see there today. And two of them you would access from over here. And then the other two are located on the island here. So the USS Arizona that we saw in the video is in the water right here. And right here is the memorial. And even though it's really close to Fort Island, you can't actually access it from Fort Island. You have to come over here to the Arizona Memorial Park where you get on a boat to come out to the memorial. And the other historical site that you would see on this side is the USS Bofin submarine. So if you want to check out their website, that submarine did serve in nine patrols during World War II, and they have a lot of really good information about the men who served on the submarine as well as the different patrols they carried out. So once you were done over there, you would come across the Fort Island Bridge. This bridge actually isn't that old. It's just over 20 years old. So prior to that being built, you would actually take a ferry out to the island, and that's how you would access this space. So this is still an active Navy base today, which is why when you're over here, you'll get on a shuttle bus to come over because you do have to have special base access. So once you get over here, the other historical site besides our museum is the USS Missouri Battleship. So if you're not familiar with the Missouri, this is the ship on which the Japanese signed the final surrender to end World War II. And then you would come on down here to our museum. So like I mentioned in the video, these hangars were here as well as this building here during the attack on Pearl Harbor. So if you get to visit us someday, it's a really unique experience where you get to share in living history. And what we mean by that and some examples of that are that our museum still bears some of the scars of that attack. So Ford pointed out the bullet holes in the windows of 79 in the video. And then also beyond our hangar on the island itself, there are other markings left behind from this attack. So for instance, down here, there used to be another hangar, hangar six that used to, uh, that got hit in the corner of it with a bomb during the attack. And you can still see bomb splatter and strafing marks from the fighter planes down here. And all these things serve to remind us of what happened here that day and all the people who lost their lives and all the men and women who will go on to serve in World War II for the United States and her allies. So some other Melissa, things- can I, can oh, yeah, I go point ahead. out um, Hangar 6? Or well, uh, you, Hangar 6 used to be there, but it's no longer there. But Hangar 6, where that cursor is right now, was ground zero for our involvement in World War II. That's where the first bomb dropped in the attack on Pearl Harbor occurred at 7.55 on that December 7th morning. And what's interesting about that particular bomb, that bomb caused the one and only fatality on Ford Island that December 7th morning. Aviation Ordnanceman Ted Croft was the only one killed on Ford Island during the attack and Ted Croft was in hangar number six when that first bomb dropped in the attack on Pearl Harbor. All right, so some of the other things that we just wanna kind of point out to you that's happening on Fort Island today is you can see there's a lot of military housing and what some of our viewers might not realize is there are a couple other memorials on this island. So right over here, before you would get on the Missouri, there's a memorial for the USS Oklahoma. And then on this side, if you can see this little thing sticking out of the water, there's actually still another ship in the water. That is the USS Utah. And there are 54 men that were entombed on that ship as well that remain at this memorial over here. And then, oops, sorry. <laughs> and then one other thing is we have some hangars here that have been converted for NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They have a regional center on the island as well. So there's a lot of historical preservation in addition to it being an active Navy base. And one thing that uh, we need to point out is that the, the Utah and the Arizona were the only ships that were never raised after the attack on Pearl Harbor. So all the ships that were severely damaged and sunk during the attack, only two remain on the bottom of Pearl Harbor to this day. The rest were all put back into service, with the exception of the Oklahoma. All right. Anything else you wanna add for it before we go on? Nope, that's it. All right, perfect. All right, so we're gonna give you just a little bit more up close view of our museum. So. 
Here's another picture of the tower, one of our jets that we have, the F-86 Sabre. Um, our tower has been repainted a little bit, so it looks a little nicer now. <laughs> um, and then we have Hangar 37. This is a picture of what it used to look like, and this hangar used to be used for seaplanes. And then this is the entrance to our museum now, and this is that same hangar that we just saw and another one of our jets. So Hangar 37 is kind of the main area of our museum, and it houses our a majority of our World War II aircraft. So when you enter into our museum, you would actually start over here. Whoop, my cursor's here. Um, and this is the Japanese Zero that you would see. So you begin your tour with the Japanese aircraft, which is how World War II is going to begin for us and the attack on Pearl Harbor begins. And we also have another addition over in this area now too, where we have a Cape Bomber. So we have two types of aircraft that the Japanese use to carry out their attack on Pearl Harbor. And then the rest of the aircraft that you would see in this area, this hangar of our museum, they all serve to represent different stories of men and women who served in the war or different events that happened. So for instance, we have our B-25 Mitchell bomber here, and this helps us tell the story of the Tokyo Raid or the Doolittle Raid that happened in 1942. And then another example will be we have our SBD Dauntless here that helps tell the story of the Battle of Midway. All right, so then we have our other hangar, Hangar 79. This hangar also has seaplanes in it, and then also, like Ford said, it was used for repair and maintenance of aircraft during World War II. So they could be aircraft who were uh, stationed here at Pearl Harbor, or maybe they were en route to serve in a battle in the Pacific. And this hangar, the majority of the aircraft are jets. So, so this shows us how aircraft evolved after the World War II era. Although we do also have World War II planes in this hangar, this is probably one of our most popular airplanes that people like to see at our museum. This is the B-17. These are also called Flying Fortresses, and this one in particular is nicknamed the Swamp Ghost. So it has a really unique World War II story. Um, just a brief version of it to give you real quick is that this aircraft was on a mission in the South Pacific and it got in a fight with a bunch of Japanese airplanes and they were leaking a lot of fuel so the pilot had to make the decision to crash land this aircraft and he thought he was landing in the grassy area in Papua New Guinea but it turned out to be a swamp. So while the crew survived, the aircraft did languish in that swamp for about 60 years before coming here to our museum, which is how it earned its name, the Swamp Ghost. And, and then we just want to give you a visual example. We were talking about the bomb splatter and the strafing that remained behind from the attack. This is what that would look like on Fort Island if you were walking around. Anything else you want to add, Ford? Nope. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> all right, and then again, this is just what Fort Island looks like today with all its historical sites over here and here. All right, well, if Ford's good, then we do have some resources that we want to share with you today as well. I'm gonna pull those up. All right, so we were talking in the video about how Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, and we just want to give you some resources to better help your understanding of that. So we have here um, a little overview for you, two key things that the Japanese are going to use to have a successful attack on Pearl Harbor are advances in aircraft technology and the usage of the aircraft carrier. So we have a little overview of that and talking about how that impacted their attack on Pearl Harbor. A little geography activity you can do here as well, um, learning the Hawaiian, the key Hawaiian, main Hawaiian islands, and showing you where Oahu is here. And a little extra challenge in the uh, video, Ford told you the story of the Japanese pilot Nishikaichi, so you can try to find where that island is as well here on the map. And then next we have a little um, comparison for you of a battleship and an aircraft carrier. And we have the Missouri and the Enterprise, two of the most famous ships from World War II. And you can actually click on these right here to learn more about these ships that served in the war also. And then lastly, a little comparison and contrast of two of the aircraft that were present at the Pearl Harbor attack. So we have the USP-40 Warhawk and the Japanese Zero. And again, you can click on these to learn more about them. And then using the little information we gave here, we have this little quiz question. See if you can figure that out and find the answer here. And one last thing, there is a link here to learn about two American pilots who end up fighting back during the attack on Pearl Harbor. And that's a really cool story if you would like to hear about those men. 
Um, you can find these resources on our website and you can also have links in the comments below this video if you'd like to print those out. You can color the ships or the aircraft and just kind of learn more about that attack on Pearl Harbor. So I think, Ford, do you have anything else you want to add? No, you, that, that was awesome. <laughs> well, thank really you, cool. Ford and Melissa. That was, those pictures were, were really cool. And while you all were talking, we had a ton of questions come in on Facebook. We are still taking questions, so don't forget to put them in the Facebook comments. But I have a few, and I actually want to start because you talked a little bit with the planes. So Rick wanted to know how many Japanese planes were, were downed during the attack? How many Japanese aircraft? There were 29 Japanese aircraft that were shot down during both wave attacks on uh, Pearl Harbor that Sunday morning. And how, how long was that attack exactly? The attack of both waves, only about two hours. So Christy, this is also a question I had wanted to know. In your opinion, Ford, what is the coolest thing at the museum? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a little partial. Uh, when I started um, working at the museum, well, 12 years ago, I started off in restoration and that Japanese zero that we have on display, which is extremely rare. I had my hands uh, on that aircraft, helping restore that aircraft. So that particular zero is dear to my heart. <laughs> so I, I think that's the, the pretty much the coolest exhibit aircraft that we have on display currently is that Japanese. Melissa, your favorite artifact or coolest artifact? Oh, it's so hard. I was trying to, while Ford was talking, I was like, what's your favorite thing? So, um, <laughs> I do really like the Japanese Zero just because of what it can do. But one of my favorites is probably also one of our favorites of our students. It's on all of our logos and all of our name tags and everything, which is the P-40 Warhawk with the shark mouth that served with the flying tigers. Very cool. And this is actually a question from more than one person. Rick and Gabriel wanted to know, so if you wanted to see or come to the museum, what kind of documentation do you need to get onto Fort Island because it's a military base still? Actually, um, because Fort Island is still an active naval base, in order to be able to drive on, you'd have to have a Department of Defense ID card. But visitors can get onto Fort Island from the Arizona Memorial Visitor Center. Uh, there is a free shuttle that can take them from the visitor center over the Fort Island Bridge to visit the USS Missouri and the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. So and I have been, and I highly recommend that if you have not been to the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, you go um, as soon as this is all over. But we have a ton of questions coming in. Um, so. Bridget wants to know, what were some of the names of the battleships that were, were at Pearl Harbor that day? Well, interesting that uh, the fleet battleships uh, of the United States Navy were named after the states of the Union. So you had the Arizona, you had the California, the Tennessee, West Virginia, Oklahoma, and California. And I mentioned California, yeah. And so this kind of goes with Cindy's question then, um, is the USS Arizona still being repaired? No, it's not. Uh, it's still an active naval ship. It is still on the naval register, but it, it, they're, they're not doing, making any attempts to uh, restore or keep the Arizona from further deterioration. And can you, can you visit the USS Arizona Memorial? Yes, you can. There is a shuttle from the Arizona Visitor Center that will take you by boat to the Arizona Memorial itself, and visitors can actually go into the memorial and, and spend a few minutes um, exploring the Arizona and the memorial itself. All right, let's see. We have a couple more questions coming in. Um, Mark wants to know how many American fighters were able to get airborne during the attack? Oh, that's a good question. There were a handful of American uh, aircraft that were able to get airborne. Um, a handful of them were from uh, Wheeler, which is in central Oahu. 
And that's where, um, if they go on to that link that Melissa explained about the two pilots, Lieutenant Ken Taylor and uh, Lieutenant George Welt, can sh share a, a fantastic story about those two pilots. Um, and um, there was another pilot, his name was Lieutenant Phil Rasmussen, and he was also able to get airborne. And um, he was credited with shooting down a Japanese Zero. But, um, you know, because this thing happened so quickly, he ran into and jumped into the cockpit of his aircraft, still wearing his pajamas. So he was forever known as the pajama pilot. And what's interesting is pajamas were purple. So he was the purple pajama pilot. I bet he never lived that one down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have one last question, and this is from Ina, and she wants to know, why is the USS Arizona so famous? Um, I think the, the biggest reason was because the, it was the greatest single loss of life on, on that December 7th morning. In fact, the, um, the Arizona is the greatest single loss of life on a U.S. Navy warship. In, in the U.S. Navy history. And so just that, that, that distinction makes it, the Arizona, very important when it comes to Pearl Harbor. There, is there a famous story about a, a man named Dory Miller, right? Is that on the USS Arizona? Nope, the D Dory was, if I'm not mistaken, was on the, um, the Tennessee. Oh no, I mistake it. My the West Virginia, and he was a steward's mate. Uh, and um, during the attack, um, the the battleship's captain was severely injured, and Dory provide aid to that captain. And he also took control of a machine gun during the attack, and he helped defend uh, Pearl Harbor with that machine gun, even though as a steward mate. He, that wasn't his job. He was never trained for it, but he took it upon himself to get involved in the protection of Pearl Harbor. All right. And, and with he, that, oh, go ahead, Ford. No, and he was awarded the Navy Cross, the second highest naval medal that you can earn, and it was the first uh, African American to receive the Navy Cross by the, from the Navy. And I think that they just announced the next uh, aircraft, U.S. aircraft carrier is going to be named after him at Pearl Harbor, right in January? Yes. Very cool. So that is all we have time for today, but I wanna thank Melissa and Ford for sharing your museum and those resources. Um, those resources will be available on a PDF form. We've been putting them out and then we will have them out on social media today. And we will see you guys back tomorrow to learn a little bit more about the attack on Pearl Harbor. All right, thanks everyone for joining and we will see you same time tomorrow.